Well, we got our California weather back. For a couple so days nice. at least. It's so nice out there today. Oh, man. I think it's like, it's it's definitely above 80 degrees outside. I want to say it? it's about 83, 84. It was warm when I stepped outside. I think nice. we were talking about the other day. I'm, I've become very, very acutely aware of my attitude and mood when the sun is out versus when it's not. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like I, I used to not really recognize it, but now I think over the past few years, like I literally am irritable when it's rainy and, and cloudy for multiple days in a row. And then the sun comes out and it's like, the sun's come out. It's a whole new world. I know. It's one thing to recognize it. It's another thing to like crave it. I, yeah. You know I, I mean? find myself craving. I mean, it doesn't help that I'm in a floor. I mean, even we have good lighting out there, but I have, I'm in a fluorescent gym for like 13 hours. Every day. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Antsy. It, yeah. It is. I, I mean, do my little laps only have around. windows on the one side. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it has been, it's been gorgeous. The, the weekends have been great. Uh, everything's green. Like if you go out on the hillside and like out into our trails and parks around here. And, and actually our county does a pretty good job with that. Yeah. The, the problem with our county is there's way too many damn people and not enough parks for them to go to. So when you go out there, it's like going to the zoo. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's gorgeous outside right now. It's and worth it for all the rain, for the green. Yeah. Yeah. It drives behavior. I mean, just yes. talking about like kind of craving it drives behavior. Like I want to be outside. Uh, you know, I want to go. I went to uh, the park on Saturday morning and just went through, just jogging us about a half mile down to the park where there's turf. I was working on some sprint drills that uh, I know I'm going to be sort of tested on in these, some upcoming of, um, events and things that I'm going to. And uh, kids are out playing soccer. Parents are out sipping their pumpkin latte mochas or whatever the hell they have while their kids Wrong are playing. Season, I, and, think, uh, but. <laughs> I don't know. The moms are still wearing Uggs in those stupid sweaters. Yeah. Uh, That's right. They're keeping jeans. it going. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people playing pickleball, people playing volleyball, send them nets and stuff like that. So, anyway, so I, I got a... I got a call from an old client the other day, just kind of catching up. And uh, she was like, I, I was like, so how's it going? She's like, oh, my back's really fucked up, you know? And I'm like, hey, well, what's going on? She, she she had pack issues in the past. And and I knew about those. We always worked around them. She's like, well, I think you just kind of overdid it the other day. And I go, oh, what, what were you doing? She goes, she goes, well, I mean, the weather's been so nice. I decided to go out for a run. I go, you ran, did you? And this is not in her typical repertoire. And I hadn't seen her or talked to her for a long time. So yeah. I don't know. I go, well, how far did she run? <laughs> she goes, well, I tried to do a 5k. On day <laughs> out one. Of the blue day one. <laughs> day one. I go, and your back feels, feels weird. Stupid is. That's, yeah. Stupid does. yeah, exactly. Oh like I was like, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but really not, not really yeah. at the same time. I, I, I just going back, I'm like, well, why are you, why Obviously, why 5K on day one? It's like, oh, because I used to do that all the time, and I really didn't feel I'm. I'm in pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good shape. I'm pretty fit right now, and I believe her. Like I haven't seen her. I was like I said, this is a phone conversation. She she stays on top of her game, so she's probably doing her regular, you know, three to five days a week in the gym and staying active. But to go out and try and pull off 5K um, on her on her first day, you know, I again, this was. Her, she's kind of a motivated person. Well, what drove that? She's like, man, it's, I mean, it's getting warm and I just need to get, you know, I'm fluffy and I need to get a few pounds off. I go, ah, oh, there it is. There it is. So this was an emotional decision, maybe based on the fact that the sun's finally out and it's yeah. warm outside, but more specifically that it's warm, less clothing is covering the body and I need to get out and, and run more. This is such a common tale. So now she's jacked her back up, right? And this is kind of, this is likely going to affect her and I don't know, I haven't talked to her, but likely going to affect her in a few more workouts or whatever. And it, that's totally unnecessary. And what kind of fitness, or more specifically even, what kind of fat loss benefit did she get by trying to do five, you know, a 5K on, her, day one, on, on her first day out? After, you know, and this is for a relatively fit person anyways, who stays on top of her game and, and um, you know, eats fairly well, you know, she's pretty clean, that, that kind of thing. I don't know, that, that mindset's kind of weird. Um, so we got to talking about things and we were just kind of talking about cardio in general. And I found myself sort of re-educating her. Um, and this is a sharp person who stays on top of stuff. And I was like, yeah, it's probably time to revisit the cardio conversation uh, on the show because it's been probably over a year or close to it since we did the last one. I remember the first one, I mean, we're, we're already over a hundred episodes um, into, into this, in, into the Monday episodes. And I believe that episode was like number 57 was the first one that we, that CC and I did on it. And then we did another one on heart rate zone training. And, and I think these things get a little bit lost. These episodes get sometimes get a little bit lost with people because it gets a little sciencey. 
And people don't really want to think that much about the cardio. They just want to do the cardio or it's the opposite. Fuck cardio, right? I hate cardio. I'm never going to do cardio. I don't need cardio. I have a six pack. You know, I'm yeah. lean enough. I don't need to do cardio. So I was like, again, I was going down this conversation with this, with this gal and I was like, we should probably, we should probably revisit it because this is often a very, very misunderstood topic. It's also cardio in general. And I kind of just alluded to that often gets villainized. And I, I know why, but I, it's weird. Um, but then it also doesn't get respected like what this lady just did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things she didn't respect there, starting with her own body. Uh, but at the same time, like, I think it's time to kind of go through that. And I'm hoping maybe this is helpful for people to kind of get, all right, I need to be reminded of kind of the basic tenets. What am I currently doing with my cardiovascular fitness? Where do I currently stand? How can I improve it? Why is it important that I do maintain, at least maintain it, gain some and maintain some cardiovascular fitness beyond the basic things that most people would think about when cardio comes around like this lady, which is like, oh, I do cardio to lose weight or more specifically lose fat. So um, here we go. We're going on the cardio cardio conversation. <laughs> what man, it's interesting because I feel like it's a little bit, I mean, trends in fitness and in general just come and go so much, but I feel like it's a little bit of a topic of conversation. I think there's some big heads in the industry that are kind of talking about it. Yep. And, and I think people still hear these terms like, oh, cardio is not for fat loss. They hear it, but maybe it just goes in one ear and out the other because they still they still think of it in that way. Yeah, why would I want to do it otherwise? Exactly. Like yeah. that's the that's the importance of it or that's my intention with doing it. But I mean, I, I think about for me, you know, I'm naturally a very, I'm, I'm a skinny guy naturally. That's kind of what my body type is. So for me to keep weight on, keep muscle on, it takes a lot. So I remember though, for me, even when I was 16, 17, 18, I was, I was literally like scared to do cardio because that was in... That was something, a trend of like, I think maybe from the bodybuilding scene of like oh, yeah. doing cardio, you will atrophy as soon as you step on the treadmill more than right. five minutes. And that's, I was literally, I almost had like this aversion from it. And it's crazy to think about that now, you know, 10, 15 years later. So yeah, I, 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 the physique space, the bodybuilding space certainly has not, um, has not represented the health benefits of cardio very well. Uh, it's used primarily as a calorie burning slash mm -hmm. fat loss tool. It's usually used towards the end of a, you know, like a diet or a prep cycle um, or show cycle, prep cycle, where they're going into a show where they're, they're looking to maximize or burn the most amount of calories they possibly can in the, in the attempt to burn as much body fat as they possibly can. And that's where cardio shows up and it shows up kind of in some very specific ways, but there's so much to talk about on that topic um, and at least they're doing some, I'll give them that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's just kind of, again, it's a, it's a weird thing. And because they're only doing it in those, in that way, I think it's kind of been looked at as like, this doesn't help me any other way. It quote unquote hurts me going back to what you were just saying. Like it's eating up calories that I could be using for the gains rather than, you know, if I'm not in a cut, if I'm in a bulk, then no way am I doing cardio. <laughs> yeah. You know, that kind of thing. You know, when I think about the socio-historical component of cardio as it relates to women in health and fitness, the things that I think about are, you know, back in the day in your 50s, you know, women weren't in the gym setting, in the weight room setting. They And if they did something like that, it was more like jogging or well, We don't even have to go back to the 50s. We don't have to go that, <laughs> that far. So. No, but I mean, you know, if you look at the history books, as far as women in sport, yeah. women didn't participate in sport because there was this idea that you were going to harm your reproductive organs. So I think it was back in the, maybe even in the 50s or 60s when women's basketball came out, women stood in one place. They weren't allowed to move on the court. They, <laughs> weren't, right? running, yeah. <laughs> they weren't running up and down the court. Like oh you had to stand goodness. in one spot and pass the ball. No. Um, and then if you think about just different cultures and stuff like that too, for women, it's import it was important to be a aesthetically looking um, and you didn't want to be too masculinized. So what sports are there if that women are going to participate in? You're talking about running. You're talking about tennis. You're talking about golf. You're talking about those types of sports. Uh, yeah. Swimming so and diving. So what I heard you say was golf, tennis, I'm going to cross into pickleball. That's more feminine than masculine. Is that what I just heard you say? Well, if you think about it, tennis, you wear skirts. 
right? I don't know, do you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. In women's tennis, you wear skirts. Uh, you don't wear <laughs> shorts or pants women's. back in the day. Across the you line. Know? I don't know. Yeah, I hear where so, you're coming from. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah. So historically, for women, I think the trend for fitness was more cardio based types of activities mm-hmm. or movement activities where you didn't take up a lot of space or you weren't too aggressive, mm-hmm. you know? So yeah. So yeah. Cardio is kind of like, it's soft, I mm-hmm. think is what I hear you saying. Yeah. Like in, in, in or a, socially in a, appropriate. Yeah. I guess in a, in a larger sense, I would have to agree with that. I guess that sentiment and kind of looking at it as like, you don't need to do cardio, just lift heavy shit. Dude. Yeah. You know, be a man as they say, yes. you know, whatever, yeah. like sack up and lift, you know, do a deadlift or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's a very short sighted look at cardiovascular exercise because I've done some really, really, really fucking hard cardiovascular, cardiovascular based events where I'm going to tell you, right, the dudes that were winning those things and podium on those things were some tough sons of bitches. Um, and, and there's a lot of other professions out there and events out there that require a high, a high level of cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory fitness in order to perform. And I just think people are kind of disconnected from, from those, but. Well, it's interesting that you say that too, because I feel <clears> like for me, as in, as being someone who really ignored that side of things for a long time, I feel like it almost takes more grit and, and mm. uh, effort and intention to do like, to go on a, I don't what know, degree? you know what, this, Steven, we were talking about, speaking of running and all that. He was just on Sunday, we were just talking about, he goes, I was like, oh, you're working out today on Monday. And he's like, oh, I'm a little sore. I did 16 miles through the mountain, the 3000 yeah. elevation climb the other day. And I was like, I think I've ran 16 miles in the past year, maybe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but man, yep. I, but I couldn't, I can't imagine doing that. I mean, that's so, that, that's, that takes a lot of tough and grit and mental fortitude that I think a lot of people don't honestly don't even have. Yeah, that's an interesting aspect you just brought up, but I, I don't think I really ever looked at it that way mm-hmm. because I've been involved in so many different things is, is cardio being kind of looked down upon because it's just, you know, maybe people perceive it as being not that hard or it's not tough mm-hmm. at all. That's just somebody that has zero fucking clue about their cardiovascular system, how to train it, how to, how to, to build performance in it. Um, and I know that crosses over when you start to get into other things where there are, say, professions or jobs uh, where people are their capability relies uh, a, a good deal on their ability to perform at a moment's notice, right? Whatever that happens to be. I, I think about our first responders and what are, what am I walking into? Am I walking into something that could last 30, 45 minutes, 90 minutes, you know, 120 minutes, or is this something that's going to be over in two minutes and how cardiovascular fitness, you know, plays into that in terms of your ability to perform, move, produce power, uh, utilize the strength or the maximal strength that you have, um, endure the thing, whatever it is, if it's a, a, you know, if you're talking about a massive structure fire, right, as a firefighter, and you're going through this process where it takes hours and hours to, to put this thing out, like, obviously, that's a different type of fitness than, you know, um, somebody that has to maybe a um, you know, I was, again, I was talking about professions here, like a law enforcement officer that has to jump out of the car and sprint a hundred meters to make contact with somebody, rescue somebody, whatever, confront somebody or, or deal with somebody else's worst day, you know, kind of thing. Those are two very different levels of fitness that require a high level of capacity specific to their cardiorespiratory system. So anyhow, without like, I guess I'm trying to make a case for why cardio is important and why people should look at it. Um, seriously and maybe a little differently, I think part of that is is making them aware. It's kind of educating them on, let's look at some of the basic tenets of what um, what we're talking about when we're talking about cardio training. Because I look at it a lot of times and people are just like, I'm just going to go run. Run more. I was just having this conversation with somebody who's a, been a professional athlete, uh, currently working with professional athletes. And uh, we were just talking about like building that cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory base to and capacity in order to support all the other things that there are those athletes that they're working with. And he was, he, he does or, or, or trying to do. Um, and the, the old tenant is just run more, right? Run more and running works, running more works until it doesn't. And there can very quickly be a, uh, a diminishing point of returns on the investment that you're putting in there. I get where it came from. I right, get where it came from, the long distance stuff that happened back in the day. But um, when I say back in the day, it's really not that long ago, but the long distance stuff is just run more mileage, get more volume. Volume is important. So is intensity. We talk about that on the resistance training side. 
things all the time. But if you don't understand what, what you're adjusting with regard to volume and intensity and why and what's going on under the hood internally, then it won't make a lot of sense. Um, but there's ways you can leverage these things. So basic tenets. I mean, so let's talk about cardiovascular exercise. To me, when I look at it, it's something that's typically, typically would be looked at as this, be looked at as something rhythmical mm-hmm. that's, that's oftentimes lower impact right? That goes on for minutes to hours, right? Yeah. Um, a longer duration of time. And you can kind of break it down into the way, the easiest way to look at this is just sort of, um, there's four kind of principles we take a look at when we're adjusting or getting into cardiovascular training. I look at it as, you can look at it as, the acronym would be FIT, F-I-T-T, frequency, intensity, time, and type of exercise. So yeah. those are kind of all the things. But I think if we peel back a little further and you go, just like, Okay, well, what's going on when we're adjusting frequency, intensity, and type? Um, what's going on on the inside? Like, what are the things that are working? Um, so maybe we just break that down and talk about the basic tenets of kind of what's happening with cardiovascular exercise, why you want to know about it, and how, if you do, it can help all the other things you're doing, particularly as it relates to building strength, power, longevity, um, and ultimately maintaining a lean, healthy, healthy body. Well, I think it's interesting because I, I think you kind of touched on it, those two different individuals and how that's a very different um, prerequisite to be able to perform in those situations. A lot of people, I think just, we just throw this term around cardio, oh, cardio, I need to do more cardio. But I, I still have this conversation with clients probably once a week, honestly, that they don't understand that there's very different degrees of cardio. There's different energy systems. There's different rest times. There's different intensities. We all bunch it together as like, well, and even from the lifting side of, oh, I get my heart rate up and I'm breathing harder. That's cardio, right? But there's these different energy systems that have very, very different intentions. So some might be more your ability to do a, a, a long degree or a, 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 a larger time of work. Maybe it's at a lower intensity. These things help with even like mitochondrial health. These help with recovery. These helps with different fiber types versus your capacity or your heart rate recoverability, like when you think of that person who had to sprint a hundred meters, then they also need to be able to sprint a hundred meters, then recover to do whatever task they need. Mm -hmm. That's another form of output and energy system Mm -hmm. that is very different than that person who's doing that low intense state that maybe just running more miles will get you. So I think it's very, people don't understand that they're very different ways to train these things. So. Yeah. I think when we're looking at it, let's, let's look at sort of the, the, um, the the basic variables that are being adjusted here. So you ju- you just talked about energy systems. We talked about the frequency, intensity, time, and type. You know those those principles. Well, let's break it down. Like what is being impacted when we do some type of cardiovascular training? And 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 then as you're listening to this or you're thinking about it, you look at it. Those two different individuals you just sort of presented there. Um, and what's happening? We're talking about cardio, but we're talking about endurance. We're talking about your body's ability to endure whatever movement duration, time, intensity, or type um, um, specific to the task that's, that's being demanded of it. So the point of this is, is I think there's a few things you got to look at. First thing is heart rate. And most yes. people have heard of this, right? So how many times per minute your heart beats? So there's a resting heart rate and then people have heard of like max heart rate and then there's heart rate zones. There's things in between. So effectively, how many times in a minute does your heart have to beat, right? In order to move Blood and oxygen through blood your body, and oxygen. right? So then, yeah. So the next thing is, is like the stroke volume. Yes. Yeah. I was just going to say that. Yep. So like how much blood and oxygen and nutrients and all those things, how much gets pushed per beat? So of the heart rate that you have, how much blood is actually being pushed through there on each beat? And then the last, the last thing is like the, the contractility of the heart muscles or the vascular system itself. And so you have your, your, your heart is basically a muscle. Right. And the vascular system has actually got some contractility to it as well. Right. There's there's a little bit of that there. So when we build strength and endurance with there or through that, we can become more efficient, but effectively we can do more work, right? With less output in terms of energy expenditure, cost, stress, when we have a uh, high stroke volume, that is every time that heart beats, it pumps a more can put, Maybe twi- mine might be pumping twice more. If we were the same same height, same size, same weight, whatever, because I'd been doing some cardiovascular training, my heart may be able to pump double the amount of blood per beat 
that your your heart might be able to. Now think about that at rest. Yes, that's what. And at working. I mean, that's where that's where a lot of people know, like, oh, if you're fitter, you have a lower resting heart rate. So where that's advantageous is, you know, we want to train, we want to push our body to be able to handle stressors. But when we don't want it to be stressed, we don't want it to be stressed. So when we're at rest, if you have a higher stroke volume, and then there's even AVO2 utilization, how you're utilizing that oxygen through blood flow, capillary density, all these different things that when you're at rest, your my heart, if I have a fitter heart than you, it is working not as hard. It's not having to push as, it's not having as many beats per minute that it's just constantly just to get the blood, squeeze that blood through there, right? right. And the it's oxygen efficiency. efficient, right? So that's the that's the adaptation that we get. That's how those correlate. That's that's why that's another benefit if we think of longevity, right? You're not putting strain on your heart throughout the lifespan when it's more efficient and stronger. So yeah, I think you know if we, we look at the average heart, average heart will beat or pump about four to six liters per minute at rest. That's sitting doing nothing. That's a lot. So I think mm-hmm. of like a like your Nalgene bottle or one of those, you know. Uh, you look at like the liter and a half bottles and then the liter bottles of of water that you might buy in the store that you have just sitting on your on your desk at work listening to this or in the console, your truck or whatever, you're driving down the road, four to six of those in a minute, right? Without um, without working. Well, as you start to ramp up intensity of whatever your activity is, and let's say you're you're on a bicycle or you're running or you're rucking or you're something, you know, you're being chased by a lion, right? That can go up to as many as 35 liters, 30, 35, 36 liters yeah. in a minute. Mm-hmm. So think about that and how much more blood the demand becomes um, for your body to get that much more blood and oxygen. And think about that, just going back just real quick, blood carries oxygen. It also carries nutrients, carries nutrients in and carries waste products away. So the importance here is, is you have blood moving away from the heart, but moving back to the heart. The blood moving away from the heart is supplying all the things like along the way with blood or with the oxygen, nutrients, fluids, lots of things going on here um, at a cellular level or to set your body up to work uh, efficiently at a cellular level. I'm going to come back to this in a second. At the same time, it's picking up all the bad stuff, the waste products, the CO2 that your body is now expending. If it's utilizing oxygen, go back to cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory fitness. There is a waste, there are waste products that are, that are, uh, developed there. And those need to be carried to the places that they can be buffered, they can be uh, filtered, and they can be excreted or dealt with. Or reutilized. Reutilized. Yeah. And so that's really important when, you're under, when, when, you, when, you, when it comes to cardiovascular training and kind of how you're putting things together is to understand that process. So the more efficiency I can have in doing all those things, then the faster, bigger, stronger, more recovered, more healthy uh, athlete or person I can be both at rest and while working. So if I have not been doing any training whatsoever, now I've just put the, but I have all this muscle on my frame, right? I'll just go back to my, this lady I was talking to the other day. She's, she's pretty well built, right? So she's got all this muscle on her frame. She trains, resistance trains four or five days a week. She's kind of like the bodybuilder type, right? She's got all of this stuff that needs blood and nutrients, but she doesn't have a cardiovascular system to support it on a 5K run. How do you think that muscular system performed <laughs> right during that time. And there's a lot of other things that are going going on from a from a um, metabolic perspective that um, we can we can talk about a little bit. But bottom line is she's not going to be very efficient, so she's going to be she's going to have to be really grinding, as you were saying before. It took probably a lot of mental fortitude yeah. for to get get through there, not just to get through it, but then also, like I said at the end, not efficient at supplying the, maybe the muscles and the tissues that need to support her during that, that run for the five K she went on. No wonder her back is bothering her because she already had some weakness there. She just exposed all of that because she wasn't fit for that activity going into it. So without getting too deep into the weeds, there are a lot of stuff going on. So if you understand those basic components of base, those basic tenants, that is what we are trying to improve the whole time. And what we're talking about there really at a base level is oxygen uptake. Your body's ability to onboard the oxygen and then take it. And again, there's other nutrients and stuff in there, but take it to the places it needs to, to, to be in order to perform aerobically. All right. That is with oxygen as a fuel source for the cell. So we can get into energy systems in a second. But the second part of that is actually, actually the 
your abil- your body's ability to utilize the oxygen. Mm-hmm. So there's uptake and there's utilization. Yes. And there are some people out there that are very good with the uptake piece, but not so great at the utilization piece. And primarily because they're not training that way or they're training so hard, right? That their body doesn't become efficient at doing the utilization piece because they don't know how to manage those things and are not getting a real training benefit from it. So that might actually blow people's minds. Um, but those are two, two, two components that we really want to understand is the uptake and the utilization of that oxygen. So anyways, as we're going back to cardio, right? Cardio, you know, we have to talk about energy systems um, and kind of what's going on there. The difference between, say, resistance training and cardiovascular training at a few different levels. Where do you want to start with this? Where do we want to start the more intense? I mean, there's through the cellular respiration. I mean, so first the defining there's anaerobic versus aerobic energy systems, right? Mm-hmm. So aerobic means involves oxygen. Anaerobic means it doesn't involve oxygen in the energy system. Um, so something that's more intense, you, usually because there's a delayed uptake of the oxygen to be utilized, that quick expend energy, that ability to do that is initially used with systems that don't utilize oxygen directly. There's, there is some oxygen utilization to Always will be a little bit. Yeah. Right, to indirectly refill that system. But initially, you know, there's a creatine phosphate system, there's a glycolytic system, which these are the really quick bursts, you know, 15 um, seconds to a minute. Um, and then there's these getting into these longer bursts that maybe last anywhere up to two, three minutes in that glycolytic system. And then you can get into these systems that they're, they're these mid-level systems that they... Um, like where we involve like the Krebs cycle, different things like that, where they involved some degree of oxygen, but they have to be efficient at refueling that system. Um, buffering. Buffering, buffering. right, right. So a lot of people even like, we think of like lactate, if we've heard of a lactate threshold, being able to train just underneath your lactate threshold where your body is able to um, have the waste product from the lactate, the, the um, lactic acid, you know, it separates into acid and lactate, and then your body's able to reutilize, put that lactate back in as a substrate for the energy. So it's be able to maintain that kind of moderate intensity or uh, maybe upper range moderate intensity and maintain that. And then there's that very low end intensity where you have a lot of um, uh, efficiency in the utilization or a lot of um, ability, uh, energy used in that system um, on the lower end of intensity, right? So we think of that. So of the oxidative. Yeah, yeah, oxidative. There we go. That's what. So, so there's, a, there's a lot you just covered there. Yeah, and so you just went through like uh, 10 semesters of human physiology, <laughs> right? And just to memorize all the cellular respiration. So, yeah, <laughs> cell biology in a, in a very short period of time. And again, this is where people, st- they, get, they lost. get lost and they give up. They're like, I'm turning it off. Yes. Right? Don't turn it off. Um, we're trying to dumb this down, but that is the problem with cardio and exercise in general. That, are, that the industry does, and let's just say the world at large, it's constantly trying to dumb the shit down mm-hmm. and people get dumb as a result. So try to try to hang in here with us with regard to how we're trying to present this because we've done this a lot of times. It's never easy, but at the same time, there are some things you should know um, if you want to be a healthier, happier, more, you know, have more longevity, whether you're training for aesthetics, performance or whatever, as it relates to this type of exercise. You know, I, I might add more confusion here, but one of the analogies that just kind of popped in my head is, let's say you have um, a, a, thir- a three gear car instead of like a fifth five gears Mm -hmm. and you're driving a stick shift and what each gear represents with regard to the energy systems. But think of it in reverse, perhaps. I don't know. Um, Like first gear being more of of your um, going from a dead stop to a first gear and you're really giving it some gas. So that being your your, um, phosphocreatine system. And then second gear is more of your glycolytic system. So that's more of like your... Uh, mid-range, gears. mid-range gear and then your third gear is like mm, right. long distance going and that's more of like your oxidative I don't know you're running it wide open mm-hmm. I think it's kind of the opposite if I looked at it if I'm thinking about it but I, I hear where you're going with that is trying to get people to understand like the intensity the, of the work that you're doing has it plays in heavily to the benefit that you will or won't get from the exercise that you're doing so here's where we have to define like cardio work and why we're doing it like what's the goal So going back to like, again, triangle of awareness where we have uh, aesthetics, longevity, and performance here. If you're, if you're, if you're doing this for, for aesthetics or performance, man, this is critical that you understand the principles of this so that you can get out of it, what you're putting into it. 
okay, you could just go out there and run and that's fine and that's better than doing nothing. But if you have a goal and you're just doing that, then you're being dumb. Yeah. That's just the, that's just what it is. Like, are you just, are you training? Or are you fitnessing? Yes. Right. And, and I would argue this particularly because it's so this, there are so many more, I think, pitfalls with cardio training in terms of performance versus like resistance training. You're trying to get gains, just lift heavy things until you can't. Yeah. Right. And then at some point, like you're, you, again, your, your, your body's probably going to tell you like you've lifted enough, mm-hmm. right? You need to, you need to relax. You're either hurt or you're just fatigued or you're so sore or whatever. It's kind of giving you these signals. It's kind of a reverse signal that, that happens when you start to, to work hard with your cardio. And I, what I mean by that is this is like working as a, like as a, as a motivated, like, you know, healthy, you know, very fit person working in those zones one, one and two, that beta oxidative state is really hard. Yes. Because it means you're likely moving really slow. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And it does not feel hard at all. It, <laughs> you're just kind of shuffling if you're running. Make, yes. You know, I've used the term like it feels like you're jogging and maybe mm-hmm. not running, right? If you're on your bicycle, you're like spinning really high cadence, right? Really easy gear. You're not looking for any hills. You're trying to stay flat. It's, it, I feel there was a time because I was I used to do this a lot when I was training multi-sport. Um, I get really anxious. Oh, yeah. I, I really get, I, I get anxious. But the benefits that you get working there, taking your 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 heart rate just above threshold are, there. there's a ton of them, right? So you're just getting that heart rate above where, where, where it is. So there's a lot of things going or where it would be sitting kind of regularly during the day, but not so high that it takes you into a place where you're really not getting any kind of like a fitness or training benefit back. Um, and you're not adding a stress level to the body that could be contributing to recovery debt. That zone one, two, if you're doing it right, right. And you're doing it appropriately, applying appropriately, you could be increasing your rate of recovery, but yes. there is a fine line yes. between that and then tipping over into now I'm not getting anything in return and I could actually be pushing myself into more recovery debt. So we should talk a little bit about the benefits of training in zone one, zone two, what that feels like what you get from it and what you should expect. Well, I, I think the old adage, zone two is basically a talking pace. So you should be able to maintain a little bit of increased heart rate, but you're able to still basically speak through this. It's funny, we were just talking about my challenge the most of the time is, is probably zone two because I'm ADD, I just want to get the work done and you got to kind of sit in it and be with it. But yeah, being able to maintain some sort of talking um, cadence while you're still getting your heart rate elevated and you're maintaining that for a long duration. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one aspect to really look at first. But yeah, I think I said beta oxidative, and what I meant was, uh, um, <clears throat> sorry, what I meant was oxidative aerobic because we are using, um, we it's we're not using fats there as much. Yes. That your beta oxidative would be like literally sitting still. What you're probably burning most of the day because yeah. the energy demand is so low. Your body can be very efficient at breaking down fats. Um, at, and along with the oxygen that you'd be utilizing in order to use that for fuel. But as you start to increase intensity, there, there's a cost to breaking down fats. It's, it's, it's kind of expensive and it's, yeah. it's harder for your body to do. So it can't use that as much. So then it, it moves, starts to move into using sugars, like what's available to it from a yes. glucose perspective and an ATP perspective. But again, without getting too far into the rabbit hole, the benefits, you, you, we just kind of talk about what it feels like to be in zone one, zone two. But the benefits you get on there are you're increasing circulation, Mm -hmm. right? So you're pushing some of that waste product that may have been kind of stored or latent within the tissue that you trained yesterday or earlier that day or whatever out of there. And you're getting it to the places to be buffered, to be dealt with, right? To be filtered so that it can be utilized for fill or excreted for waste. So that's part of it. It also can help with the inflammation process. Yes, yes. So, which is super important. It's a circulatory thing. Like inflammation is good as long as it's not chronic or continually acute, right? That it's driving blood into into an area of the body. With that blood comes nutrients and oxygen and things to cellularly, to repair cells and tissues. So it can help move that stuff, including lymph, which is part of the system that helps you with the healing process. The other part of this is, is it does train at some level. It does train the endurance properties of the muscle type fibers or the tissue that's there that helps you actually do that activity yeah. without putting so much stress on it that it breaks that tissue down. Like when you think about like doing a heavy squat or bench press, right? So you're getting these, in, uh, again, these, the, there's a stimulus happening there to improve 
the efficiency of the cells that are there in the body that help you do that activity, mm -hmm. but not so much that it creates a stress. So you're actually basically doing a recovery and an increase in, I will call it fitness or endurance all at the same time. Um, that's really interesting, right? And so the other part of that it doesn't do, is, or the, the other thing that it does, but more specifically it doesn't do, is it's not going to dip you into a place, probably, likely, as long as you're keeping up your nutrition, your sleep and hydration, all that other stuff, not going to dip you into a place where you're going to go in recovery debt. Yes. It's actually going to help you recover. Yes. Um, and understanding recovery debt's super important because if I'm going into the negative constantly and I'm never able to recover out of that, this goes back to that fitness to fatigue model, trying to give my, my body the minimum effective dose to get the maximum result so that giving it that dose, it, it's a little bit beyond threshold, but then it recovers back beyond where I started. This is zone one, two, zone one and zone two training. And this is where probably 99% of people should be spending a minimum of 70% of their total cardiovascular training time in. But it isn't what they're doing. No. It isn't what they're doing. So again, without, again, I hope we're not losing people here, but, but the, I want people to understand the benefits of this low threshold training and what it's doing with the, with, with the, with the cardiorespiratory system, but more specifically what it's doing with that uptake and utilization process. So I was talking about those fibers getting more efficient in zone one, zone two. You're helping the cells through there be better at utilizing that oxygen. So that's the, that's the utilization piece at that level for now until we move into something else. Yeah, I guess I think of zone one and zone two as your base or your foundation of your cardiorespiratory fitness. Yeah, we've heard it referred to as like LIS, long, long <clears throat> sorry, low intensity, steady state. Yeah. Um, we, used to, we used to call it LSD. Uh, yes, long, slow distance. Long, slow distance yeah, training because it related to the runs and the, the biking. And the yeah. biking was just long, you yeah. know, you're just kind of slogging through, spinning. Um, I never looked forward to those days uh, because, again, I got anxious. I was like, I should be working harder. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, so that's kind of like the benefit there. Um, again, that old adage of just run more. Well, if you're just running more and you're taking that approach, you're probably not training in like zone two. Yeah. You're pushing into at minimum zone three and probably closer to zone four. Let's talk about like that zone three. And I should go back. We're going to talk about kind of five heart rate training zones in general. You'll see all kinds of different levels. You talked about three gears. We're not talking about three gears. We're talking about five zones. Well, we're talking about energy systems. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> talking about five zones. I've seen as many as 10. There's yeah. these in-between zones. It gets a little confusing, yeah. a little wacky. Um, not really appropriate for probably to the purposes of today's call. But as you move into zone three, right? And again, zone one and zone two. I remember for me, zone two is, a, is like 130 and below. Uh, in terms of my heart rate, going yeah. back to oh, those three basic yeah, tenets. Yeah. Yeah. I needed to keep my heart rate below 130. God, that was tough. Like, yeah. Especially on my bike. Yeah, The run, I could, man I could manage it as long as the run was flat. But the bike was just like, I want to go harder. Yeah. I, I want to push the bigger gear. Like, well, I have the strength. The other thing is too, when we're talking about your zone one and two and training in that or even getting back into working your cardio, doing your cardio and when you've been away from it and you're trying to implement it more into your workouts of being patient and working at a, a, a an intensity where your heart rate isn't getting that high because you're so used to pushing and working harder. So it takes a lot of patience. And I would say, you know, being awareness and as you said earlier, Ryan, mental fortitude to to be able to work at that threshold. Yeah, that lower threshold. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll say it again. Most people should probably be spending about 70% or, you know, at least uh, of their, their cardio training time in these zones if they're training intensely doing other things. And that's the majority of the people I talk to are people that are doing heavy, heavier weight training, right? Or, or more intense weight training. They're doing wads or going to CrossFit or something like that. Or, you know, they're boxing or they're going to jujitsu. Um, jujitsu is very different because you, it's just very different. You could be anywhere in the in the neighborhood of this, you know, when you're training there. But um, these are these are folks that are generally pushing, right? These are high achievers. It's tough to get them in the zone one, zone two. The next zone is zone three, and sometimes this one's myth or mythed, sorry, as like the junk zone or the gray zone. Yeah. Because um, and I alluded to it before, because you, it the overall statement here is because you're not really getting a return on your investment from a building of endurance or fitness. You are working. But you're not going to really, you're not working in a way where cellularly, 
right? Your your body is is having to improve, yeah. right? Or it's working just hard enough to be able to get you through the workout, but it's working slightly hard, too hard to get any like recovery benefit from it. So going back to like the the what does it feel like to be in zone one, zone two? It's it feels per- fairly easy, and part of that is because you're not pounding on your body, yeah. right? You're, it's very easy to to do from like a neuromuscular perspective. If you start to move into zone three, you'll you're, you'll feel your neuromuscular system working a little harder. That heart rate gets up a little bit. You're not so conversational with your talking. This is where the high achiever loves to be, and this is the performance zone. If if I if I had to say it, like if if you were going to go out and race or compete. This is the zone that you're probably pushing in the majority of the time. Then yeah. put, moving into zone four, maybe even zone five, but then coming back down to zone three, maybe top of zone three for those longer uh, uh, duration type of events. Like this is where you want to get good. The The challenge to get people to understand is, is like, this is where you also feel really good. Like you're like, oh, I feel strong. Like, yeah. And I also feel like I'm working out. Like my, this is, this is a tough part again, like getting on a bike ride and staying zone two. Like I wanted to push a little harder, right? Because yeah. I, I had I had gas in the tank. Yes, that's where your gas is going to be. But if you're trying to p- train for performance, like again, you're not going to build a lot of uh, future gas there, right? Your gas gets built in zone one, zone two, zone four, zone five, mm-hmm. right? You use it, right? When it, when you, when it gets called upon in zone three and then maybe in zone four, like I said, and maybe push the zone five. So like, again, talk about, go back to the firefighter and the, or the police officer and the two different things that they have to do. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the police officer that had to make the hundred meter sprint never got there. He got, he got that heart rate up and hopefully that wrestling match doesn't go too, too, too long at the end when he arrives on the other side, mm-hmm. because if he does, he may be hanging out in zone four, zone five for a while. Yeah. And if you haven't trained there, but you don't have the base that you mentioned, even if you train a zone four, zone five, and you don't have that base, like, and you just go all out balls to the wall every time, you're you're on the clock. You're on the clock no matter what, but your clock goes a lot less long if you don't have this base underneath. Again, going back to the buffering systems, your body's ability to deal with that waste product, yeah. utilize that oxygen for longer buffer things out and get real good, real good at working at slightly uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. But not, that's the, that's the thing in zone three is that people feel really, really solid there. Uh, and you, you know, you just want to, you're sweating a little bit more, like you're breathing. Like, this is a workout and I want to, I want to be working out. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say that. Cause then I feel like a lot of people want to push to this zone but then I feel like a lot of people struggle to get out of this zone. I feel like a lot of people, we, we were talking about this before of how many people actually get up into their zone five training, how, where they're actually draining that system and actually utilizing that. A lot of people don't. Most people actually kind of sit in this zone three. And so I think it's what you're talking about. It's it's just enough stimulus to actually build some fatigue, mm-hmm. maybe build some, uh, maybe even some atrophy long-term. Um, but it's it's not quite giving you, it, it's but it's not quite, quite giving you an adaptive effect either where your body's having to build more capillary density, build more blood flow, build more mitochondrial mm-hmm. uptake and things like that. The things that are important to you to increase performance or like that high effort performance too. So that's kind of how I view that zone as well. Um, yeah, the oxygen debt becomes greater, so you're feeling it, yes. right? And your body, you're feeling that like with muscle burning and things like that. And that's not a bad thing to feel, but you need to understand what's really going on there in terms again on your return on investment. So again, without getting too deep into kind of zone three, it's not a gray zone or a junk zone. It's a good zone. Yeah, you just don't want to or need to be spending a lot of time training there. But to your point, like that's where most people get to when they feel good. Like if they, again, that emotional decision to go out for a run, that's what they want to feel. They want to feel like I'm running, right? I'm not shuffling here and I don't look like an old lady running down the street or an old man running down the street. I actually look like somewhat of an athlete. I'm running down the street. And what should that look like? Well, I should be breathing heavy and I should be sweating. And my face should be red and I'm probably doing some mouth breathing, right? And that's what an athlete would look like running, right? I got to tell you, the ones when I... Think about the highly trained athletes that I've seen, trained with, and and trained over my time, and they know exactly where they're at all the time. They have no problem going out on those zone one twos, and they know they know they exactly where they are in the zone three, and they'll just dial it back. Sometimes they're programming that shit into their watch or their device, where it's beeping at them or it's buzzing on them when they get to zone three to to back out of there. They're not trying to prove anything, right? At, at you know um, when they're when they're there. 
zone three is kind of that let's go. Yes. But it's it's not, people aren't working into zone four, yes. right? Which we need to talk about. So again, zone three, there's a higher oxygen debt, right? It's not so great that your body is having to push into more of that glycolytic system again and in and, and, or in that in that uh, anaerobic system to draw and buffer things. Yeah. We're going to get there with zone four. Um, it's just high enough to kind of start fatiguing the body in a way where you're just kind of not getting much of a return on investment. So think about that. If your investment is an emotional fulfillment, go fucking zone three your ass off. Yeah. I don't care. Yes. Right? If you're I, I, looking for like a performance. You want, yeah. a, you want a performance benefit, it's not a great place to be hanging out all the time. Well, and I think just one more note about even zone three kind of into that zone four is I think that's a zone, if you've talked to a lot of experienced runners or, or experienced athletes on that side, they, one of the reasons to train that system too is to have that awareness of that system. Because that's kind of, if you're trying to go but you want to be able to maintain that for still a long duration. That's where you start to think about mm -hmm. lactate threshold, where it's this very fine line and you can train that lactate threshold or you're at more intensity, but you can maintain just under it. But as soon as you cross that over to that, that's where you start depleting glycogen yeah. stores a lot. And that's where people, they, there's that acidity and that fatigue builds up. And that's where you kind of bonk out really, really quickly. Yeah, again, so you're, you're going to like a metabolic debt, but there's not really enough stimulus here to really be building any kind of strength or power. Exactly, yeah. Right, so that's something to understand. Like you feel good here, but you're not really building anything there. So yeah, I, I don't want to beat that up anymore. Kind of moving into zone four, which is where people start, you're going to start to feel it now. Yes. Like your, your body, when I say feel it, I mean, lungs are burning a little bit more. Muscles are burning a little bit more because now there's oxygen dead and more metabolic dead in general. And your body is having to, is, is having to deal with this spillover of, you mentioned the, the terms, the lactic acid and the lactate that's starting to build up sort of in the system. And you, 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 if you stay here too long, like you're not going to be able to survive. But now we're getting into like people, this is a good, a good, people may be able to relate to this. Crossfitters, like they get really, the, the goal there was is to be able to maintain your 80% for as long as you could. That was kind of the thing. I'm, not, I'm just kind of air quoting or paraphrasing, right? You could stay, if you could stay in your 80% the whole time, you were probably going to do better than most people because being able to maintain that is, is, a, is tough. It's yes. her, it's the pain cave. Yes. Right. It's where you're starting to go. Okay. This sucks. You are mouth breathing. It's hands on hips, your heart rate, your, your, uh, your body temperature is way up. It's you're suffering a little bit. Things are starting, starting to feel heavy, starting to decline. Yeah. Right. Because what's happening is your body is, is losing its ability or it's being compromised because you're having the spillover of waste product into the system that it may or may not be able to deal with as quickly as the guy standing next to you. So if the guy standing next to you has a better buffering system, has a larger engine, has more efficiency, has, has trained these zones better, he may be able to go maybe just 30 seconds longer. Yes. The 30 seconds longer is the difference between winning and losing, or not just winning and losing, but losing by a, by a massive amount. So um, anyway, zone four. Zone four is a cool, it's a, it's a cool zone, but this is when we're starting to feel it. Definitely more intense for the muscular system. This is where you would be building um, some power and, sh and, and strength to a certain extent until you're not yeah. anymore. So there's a higher cost here, both metabolically as well as neuromuscularly. Um, you're, 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 again, now it's going to be a little bit, because of the intensity, there is a little bit more pounding and more pressure on the body. So it's going to require a longer recovery period, both during and after exercise to, to, to kind of get over, those are things to understand. So as you're training into zone four, and we'll get to zone five, if you're training into zone four, understand for every amount of zone, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a two to one recovery here. So for every two minutes that you were at zone four, you're going to need to spend one minute, you know, recovering kind of thing. So what we can talk about, we're not going to get too deep into, you know, managing your zones, but just understand when you get up into zone four, um, that th those are, it's a, it's a costly, it's a costly place to be. It's great. It's fine if you're managing all that, yeah. but just understand that's the difference. That's the threshold change from three to four where the biggest differences are. Yeah. And the, honestly, that's probably the zone that 
for me, I would have to say sucks the most because it's it's dealing enough with intensity like you're talking about where it's you're feeling it, you're feeling some even some muscular fatigue, you're feeling it, it, it's burning, but you still got to go for at least a couple minutes to you know in that range, and that's where it's it's honestly probably the the hardest for a lot of people to maintain. But I think a lot of people we were talking about this, but they get up into that range but they don't know how to pass that range. So we'll talk about that more when we get into zone five. But that, so you're being able to get into that range is important, but you still have to be able to maintain that range for a minute to two minutes. You have to still be able to push at that high mid 80, 85, 87%. And maintain that. Yeah. So a couple things like your ability to utilize oxygen is being compromised here because you're working past where it can get that. It can deal with the waste products exactly to to make to 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 get the utilize the oxygen for fuel. So you have this lactic acid lactate buildup happening. Your body's trying to buffer that. Yes. Turn that back into a reusable fuel through the pyruvate and all the things that happen in there, right? Cellularly in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. There you go. All that stuff, right? (laughs) And this is where you start dipping into the glycolytic system. So this is where you're going to start to burn up your carbohydrate, right? And where is that coming from? That's coming from your muscular system, right? Um, You you, you go long enough, it might come from your liver. Most people are not pushing hard enough to get there. But once that's gone and you've tapped into that system, it ain't coming back during your exercise. Yeah. That's the recovery process. Yes. Right? So managing nutrition, but also understanding that if you stay here too long, right? You, again, being on the clock, you are going to go well beyond what your gas tank is going to be able to handle for a long period of time. And so the idea here is that we get really good at maybe pushing into this zone and then coming out of this zone and letting it recover. So I I just went to this work to rest rate, work to rest ratios were like this two to one. So if I went up and I spent like two minutes in zone four, then come back down to zone two, or at least attempt to come to zone, zone two, reality of it is, you're probably only going to get down into zone three before then you go back up into it again. You stimulate that system, you tax it without bonking, and then you come back out of it. And, and this is during the same workout, right? And allow your body to recover. And by doing this, what you're doing is you're training the sufficiency of your body to deal with all of this stuff when it hits you uh, in a competition or in a workout or whatever the you know life might throw at you out there in the the field of life. Yes. And I think that's a really important note because I think to go back to this whole conversation, people not recognizing difference in zones, but different in rest times from like a physiological component of how do you train these systems? People don't realize that you're you're not just supposed to go until you feel ready to go with these. It, it's very specific. Some of these zones, you may feel like you're not taking enough rest, but some of these zones, maybe you're Maybe you're feeling like you're not you're taking too much rest, and it's kind of high, trying to find that teetering yep. point. Um, I, that's where a lot of this to be able to get up into these upper intensities. A lot of people think they're in this zone four, but then they rest thirty seconds and then they go back into it. You probably weren't actually pushing into zone four. So, Great point. So you talked about that two to one rest ratio, mm-hmm. like, and I, I know Cece and I are always like, I'm resting, all right, I got to take this longer, but it takes that time to be able for that system to reload to where you're pulling the energy, where you're pulling the adaptation from specific areas and not from others that you're just draining that system. So there is that, there's that term where you kind of bonk out and you use all your gl- local glycogen and then you'll feel like an, a pretty immediately uh, immediate fatigue from that. So it's learning how to dip into that and then allowing that system to almost like reload yep. before you go back into it again. And that applies to all these. Uh, there's very specific rest times that we need to look at. Yeah, so. I think it's, it's important, to, important to realize like when that starts happening, your skill level begins to drop, mm-hmm. right? So if you're performing a very, uh, a, a, a movement and exercise, some type of whatever it is that you're doing that requires a high level of skill, as you start to move up into the upper thresholds here, understand that that fatigue is going to compromise the skill. Well, yes. it's not just the skill, like the physical skill, but then the uh, cognitive skill as well. Oh, for sure. So okay. maybe doing max effort snatches, snatches. trying mm-hmm. to maintain an 87% heart rate is probably not, probably not advantageous or maybe a great way to have an injury. Just understand there's a lot of risk there. Exactly. So, so unless you're a highly skilled athlete yes. who train, who's, tra- who's trained this appropriately Very over time, yep. you're not just walking into the gym and trying to complete the water of the day and match up to everybody else on the board. Yeah. Like, okay, maybe that's great for you. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a bad thing. I'm yeah. just saying it kept our place freshly stocked <laughs> with injured people because they were taking themselves well beyond what their thresholds were while trying to perform some very high uh, skill movement patterns um, 
with by and with loads, right? That were probably way out, well outside of their their ability, ability. level, mm-hmm. right? And that creates can create issues. So again, going back to like who who are you and who's who's doing this and what your goal is. If you're a professional, right? And I don't mean a professional athlete, but a professional who depends on your body to go to work every day, right? And do whatever it needs to do to get you through the situations that you need to get through. I'd be thinking long and fucking hard about this mm-hmm. because if we're if we're training like this all the time, what how are we potentially compromising ourselves? The other part of this is is if if I'm training like this all the time, I'm not managing my recovery. I'm constantly going into the pain cave, wanting to go to zone four, zone five with whatever the watt is. And I do that at 9 a.m., right? And I'm laying there in a puddle of sweat, right? At 10 a.m., right? Trying to catch my breath. My lungs are burning. My head's pounding, right? I've, there's three piles of puke, you know, in the, in, the, in the trash can over there, which sounds cool, right? And then, they'll, then the bells start going. Then the tones start going off in the firehouse, yeah. right? Now what are you going to do? Yes. Like, I'm not saying don't train that way. I'm saying manage it appropriately. And doing it every day, it's not appropriate. Not for you or anybody else for yeah. that matter. Um, again, if you're a CrossFit athlete and you're competing in the games and you know this is the level you're going to have to compete at, do the means justify the ends? I'm not going to argue that at all. Yeah. But that is not the majority of the population. However, going back to the emotional thing, it's like, well, I'm trying to keep up with the crowd. I'm trying to compete. And the competitions never happen, ever happen in zone one, zone two. They're always happening up in zone four, zone five. That's yeah. that's where they're at. So keep that in mind as you're kind of, how do I apply this? And think about how you're how you're, you're, you're managing your runs, how you're managing your workouts, the intensity within your workouts. Uh, super important because, again, we just went through this. It's about a two to one re- uh, work to rest ratio as much as three to one. So if I went two minutes, rest one minute. If I went, if I went you know, 10 minutes, if I could go 10 minutes in zone four, which is a long time, then I should expect it's going to take me about five minutes to recover. Yeah. Um, that's just, you know, or if, it, if I went six minutes, it might take me two minutes to recover. Yeah. Right? So there's, depending on your fitness level. Um, those are things you want, to, you want to be managing. And again, why manage them? So that you can reap the max amount of benefit from the work that you're putting in and continually increase that, that um, progressive overload over time to a point where now it might be time to back off, just like you periodize your other stuff. Um, or your other, sorry, resistance training when I say stuff. So yeah. anyhow, like... It, are, are the majority of people, to your point, going to be going out and training in zone four? No. I think there's a small percentage of people that train in zone four that are going to take themselves there because of what you said. Like, it hurts. Yes. And a lot of people might think they're getting there, but they're not really getting there. Like, we can talk about hit training here in a second, but they're not really pushing hard enough. or To hit that zone. To hit that zone in the time, you know, uh, that's allotted for them to do it. And there could be a lot of reasons for why they're not doing that. Um, but it's not really hit training at that point. Right. Yeah. In my mind, hit training is going max, um, uh, sorry, max effort for the period of time that's given, which is going to be a very short period. I just said that's maybe two minutes, yeah. maybe three minutes, maybe as long as eight minutes. Yeah. Right. Total. Work. Total. Yeah. Right. <laughs> With a recovery period to match so that you recover and then go right back into it and go max effort again, knowing that each time you do that, you're able to put a little less into it because your body is constantly now being, your, your gas tank is constantly being depleted. So anyhow, that's the side trip on HIIT training. Um, anyway, so zone four. Again, that's the, it's a really effective zone. It's, up, it's upwards of that 90, 95% of what your, what your, your, your target heart rate zones would be. We, we're not going to get into that calculation. We did all that math on a different podcast. You can go back and look at that heart rate zone training. As CC and I did, but that's like 95% of that max max heart rate or lactate threshold, if you will. Let, sorry, heart rate lactate or lactate. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, lactate threshold heart rate is what it, LTHR, yeah, yeah. which is a calculation and a test that we, again, provided all the instructions for in this other podcast you can listen to. But it's up there. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. Anything above that, like 95 to 100, um, we're talking zone five. And, uh, you know, just, you know, what, what's happening there, obviously much more intense, yes. huge demand, ability to use oxygen, pretty much gone. It's not aerobic anymore. It's completely anaerobic. Uh, we're in that phospho, 
uh, phosphagen, phosphoglycolytic system. Phospho creatine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are, you're burning up that creatine that your, that you, your body stores and that you're supplementing with, if not for brain, just for brain health, for everything else. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't last very long, you know, no. it's, you know, 30 seconds, maybe, maybe a minute, maybe less, yeah. depending on who you are and what you're doing, right? It's that sprint, that quick sprint. Um, uh, managing or trying to monitor your heart rate here doesn't make a lot of sense to me really ever. Um, I don't know why you would. Some people do. Uh, I think it's interesting. I don't know what they're getting out of it. But at the same time, like, this is not something you really need to be monitoring. You know, like yes. it's, I picked that bar up off the floor three times and now I want to sit down because my heart rate is up, yeah. right? My muscles are completely fatigued and I am trashed from a central nervous system perspective yeah. because there are, there's a very high demand on both the tissues the nervous system, the cellular resp the, the the respiratory system, the cellular system, the cardiovascular system, everything has just been been trashed. That's zone five, and people do get there. Like your power lifters will get there, um, you know, during during their workouts, and that's why they get on the platform and do three reps, and then sit down for ten minutes, exactly, right before they do the next three reps, because the work to recovery ratio begins to expand pretty rapidly or pretty greatly, sorry, as you get into those higher thresholds. Yeah. I mean, so we've, we mentioned like the phosphocreatine system. So that system for these movements, you can ramp up really, really quick. You, you know, whatever, we're just shifting into fifth gear. Um, you can get there really quick. You can utilize that energy really, really, really quick. But like you just said, I think the biggest thing with this is if you do that max effort and then you 15 seconds later, 20 seconds later, you feel ready to go. Yeah, that wasn't max effort. That was not max mm -hmm. effort. I can do, you know, if we're thinking of like more, maybe a little bit longer duration, like doing a sprint or heck, we'll even use the, if I do a, if I do a maximal deadlift, I need three to five minutes minimum just to be able to feel like I can exert anywhere near that um, level of engagement, full body engagement, right? So even if you're doing like a bike sprint or something like that, maybe it's like a 15 seconds and then you do that 15 seconds and then you're ready to go and another- 15 seconds is a long time, that's, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's a long- <laughs> can be an eternity. If yeah. you're actually going at that intensity and then you're ready to go 30 seconds later, you're not there. You should do 15 seconds and need- a minute, two minutes, three minutes to even get anywhere close to being able to perform at that that maximum level. I think important for this, you know, really realistically tracking heart rate is really, I mean, it's it's such a quick jump spike and then ideally recoverability, um, but tracking your output on whatever modality you're using. Mm -hmm. So it's Just like- throw the heart rate on. Exactly. Heart rate monitor well, on. Well, yeah. but I was going to say, you can track of like output on even like RPMs, like hitting- Oh, there's specific, a ton of ways. There's yeah. a ton, ton of different ways to see that of- actually testing and you're seeing that you're getting these specific ranges it, on it, that. Yeah. So uh, RPM or metrics. velocity, yeah, yeah, metrics that you want to um, utilize versus heart rate's probably not the most, it, it's too quick of a spike to really utilize that yeah, effectively, I, think, I feel like. I think the, the question for people is, is like, how do I plug this in? How do I monitor this? It sounds like a lot, guys. You just went through a lot of stuff and I, I, that's why I don't worry about it. I just want to run. All right, just go fucking run. But if you're looking for a performance benefit and also on the longevity side, mm -hmm. so... <laughs> We didn't talk really about a lot of this, and I don't want to. I don't want to dig in too too deep into it. When we start looking at the longevity side, there is a return, a diminishing point of returns on cardiovascular fitness um, over time. We yes. know that, like there there is such thing as too much, right? It needs to be well balanced. Um, I've made some statements on the on the podcast before that 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 were there were true statements about people dying in in the health clubs, and and a lot of these people were the people that were like uber dedicated to just cardiovascular fitness. They just didn't do anything else, and um it, and and you know causation correlation or whatever else. I don't know. That wasn't the point. The point was is just that the research now. There's a lot of research now that has come out about people that have done done a ton of cardiovascular work, and it has kind of. It, it, it's had the opposite effects because they haven't managed it properly like this, yeah. uh, like we've been talking about, like the heart, right, has been overtaxed, mm -hmm. right? We have no, it has not recovered the way it needs to. The, the, the metabolic system has been taxed because it's constantly being stressed or in the stress state. Something to be said for the type of hormonal response that your cardiovascular work, if not managed properly, will give you versus your uh, anabolic work or the signals that uh, your resistance training will send. Let me let me back up on this. So 
we talked about how to manage those zones, right? And the impacts that it has on the muscular tissue, the nervous, the central nervous system, the hormone, or not so much the hormones, but the, the metabolic system when you're staying in those lower zones. And how much of your time should likely be spent there if you're trying to build that base and stay fit while also building those upper ranges. 70% is my recommendation on that. And I don't think the experts would have, I know the experts are not going to argue with me on that. Like we just know that is the place where you should be spending the majority of your time, 30% of your time on those higher intensities at most. And keep in mind, some of that higher intensity may be coming from the weightlifting workouts that you're doing, depending on how you're applying Especially, those. Yeah. yeah. How you're applying those. But here's the thing. The, the cardiovascular work is generally that longer duration stuff, mm -hmm. right? And and again, once you push into that, that those zones, starting at around zone three, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, where you're creating muscle damage, right? But you're also you're also taxing the body's energy systems and hormonal systems in order to maintain this this activity over a long period of time. Because you're not attacking the central nervous system the same way to send that muscle building signal, what you end up with is a catabolic signal, right? And that is the breakdown of tissue to find the nutrients, to make the recovery happen, to get the fuels to where they need to go. That word is a dirty word, right? In the, in the bigger sense of, of things, particularly for those people looking for the gains. I don't want to go catabolic, right? I want to stay anabolic. Well, you can if you manage this thing properly. So going back to kind of like what some of the research is showing is just that some people have gone so far into that catabolic hole for so long, it's created a lot of issues. So some, just something to think about, like you, you want to stay well, well balanced. I didn't say 70% of your training should be spent in the lower heart rate zones. It's 70% of your cardiorespiratory training, which could make, maybe make up only 30% of your total training. If you have a tra like a training program that's heavily rooted in resistance training or weightlifting, lifting weights. So just, just kind of stuff. I don't want people to take some of the stuff out of context, but how to apply it. So if I'm just getting started, don't even worry about fucking your zones. Yeah. Just go out and try and complete some distance right now and maybe track at, like subjectively how you feel. Like how is your body responding to these things? Don't go do what that lady did and go out and try to run a 5K tomorrow if you haven't been training. Just start to get your heart rate above threshold, right? For, for longer periods of time. Start with 10 minutes. Go for a walk. That's it, right? Get on a stationary bike. Just pedal. Don't, your muscles shouldn't burn. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't uh, be breathing super heavy. If you're very, very deconditioned, maybe you do. That's not the goal. The goal is just to get your heart rate above, above, you know, normal or above where it would typically be at a resting state and, and push it a little longer each time. Maybe add 10, 20%, right? Over, over, you know, every five, six days, add another 10, 20%. You can even probably do it a little quicker because you'll probably notice really fast how quickly those adaptations start to take place that we, we talked about, what your body does with those systems. The body's awesome that way. It will adapt really quickly, moving you the direction that you're trying to move it. It will also go back very quickly mm -hmm. the other way if you don't continually stimulate it. So I think that the, the takeaway there is, is like, if you're just beginning this, just get your heart rate up a little bit above threshold. Go out tonight. Go for resting. a twenty minute walk. Yeah. Easy. Take the fucking dog. That one, that thing needs exercise too. You're saying threshold. People might not know what threshold. Yeah. Is, so so like threshold, threshold meaning your 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 normal resting heart rate or yes. normal like active heart rate during the day. When I say threshold, I just mean very low. Yeah. Right. Very low threshold. Not lactate. Mm -hmm. the heart rate threshold. Yeah. Well, and I think we've talked about this a lot. As I think that's a really good way to track your progression with this is just even starting to track your steps. Um, and just seeing like if you're at a very low step count for the day and then that mm -hmm. you can just slowly increase that over time. Like that's a great goal initially for someone who maybe you're pretty sedentary. So that's kind of the same thing of increasing the mm -hmm. duration and all, and all that. So yeah, if you're a high achiever and you're like, no, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to really do this. Yeah, I know that's what you want to do, but I want to yeah. go back to building that base engine and having yes. that to work from. Again, go back to oxygen uptake versus oxygen utilization. Because you could probably go, you're the big, strong dude, right? Who could probably go to the gym right now and go through the wad for 30 minutes or whatever and get through it and probably be better than most people. But are you working at the efficiency level you possibly could be if you don't have the oxygen uptake capability yet? Because if you don't have that, then your utilization piece is going to be compromised. I'm just saying, if you spent a little time in those lower zones and you built that engine to be able to draw from, you built those buffering systems, right? You built that, the, the 
tissue's ability to deal with these things. Like we didn't even get into like slow twitch, fast twitch mm-hmm. conversions, yeah. things that are going on there, creatine or your your uh, your 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 larger muscle cells being able to provide the larger, sorry, fast twitch muscle cells being able to provide the slow twitch muscle cells, a little bit of that creatine that it might have stored yeah. in order to increase. These all need to be trained. This doesn't just happen, right? Mm-hmm. Because you decided to go work out at zone four, zone five today. I'm telling you, go spend some time down there. Um, get a bicycle, right? Go, for, go, for, go, go start riding. You want to run, run. But if you're going to run, don't go running to be a champion runner, right? Don't go running like you ran back in, in college, right? Go out, maybe strap that $800, you know, device that you bought that sits on your wrist that you never use, right? That just gets text messages and, you know, Instagram notifications. Turn that thing on, watch your heart rate and see what it does. Um, Cause I guarantee you, if you haven't been doing this, you're going to, and you're one of those guys, if you will, you're going to be in zone three right away, mm-hmm. r- right away. Um, and then if you're out there longer, if you might even go into zone four, you're like, oh, I got this, right? Well, you fucked it up. I'm just saying, if you're trying to build your base, you're trying to build your engine, you fucked up. You're going too hard. And that might sound weird, but it's the truth. And the top level people that I talk to that work with like tier one type tactical athletes, I hate that term, but these are people that are like, as we got a lot of those guys that listen to the show. That's why I'm saying that. They're going, I'm constantly just trying to get my guys to go back to zone one, zone two training. Mm-hmm. Constantly. It's yeah. the hardest thing for me to do. And it's the biggest, it's the biggest limiting factor between them uh, reaching the highest level of performance that they can. Um, that's the hard, hard th- hardest thing for them to do. So I, I don't know. Maybe take their advice. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, if you look at the speeds and uh, we go back to cross country skiing, because I know we've talked about this on previous podcasts, as far as their training, they're spending a lot of time in zone two and mm-hmm. it takes a lot of patience. Yeah. I mean, it really does. And time, mm-hmm. right? A lot of times, because you, you're trying to increase You don't have to go hours at a time. I mean, if those are the events that you're going to compete in hour long, long distance events, then you do need to spend a lot of time there. And it's, it's can be very boring and lonely out there doing it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, But you know, again, do you need to be doing that if you're, if you're going to be entering a CrossFit competition? No, you don't have to go spend hours doing this, but spending again, 70% of the hundred percent of the time that you're working on your metabolic engine, right. Or that, that cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory engine should be spent in and around there. You know, and then obviously being able to manage and do a really good job. You mentioned like, are you really working hard enough, all right, to get the the benefits of that zone four, zone five, and then obviously the recovery piece. Uh, I know a lot of people out there that are posting these workouts or doing these things. And when you see them doing the workout, just ask yourself, are you working as hard as that dude? Not are you as fit as that dude? Yeah. But are you working as hard as that dude? One of my new favorite humans on the planet and this guy I really love and, and talk to kind of daily now about a lot of things is Jacob Hebner. I don't know if you know who this mm, is. No. Jacob was like a, I don't know, I think he was a six or seven time CrossFit Games, you know, like kind of competitor winding up in the finals or whatever. But he's he's doing kind of his own thing now through a few different, through, through a few different avenues. And he's constantly posting, there's a lot of shooting. He, he competes in the tactical games. So he's, always, he's always posting those videos in his workout videos, right? And the workout videos where he's doing his, what you're not seeing a ton of, which would be like his strength training uh, blocks and things like that, where he's just getting over the bar, or under the bar, or things like that. There's not a lot there, right? Because it's kind of slow, kind of boring, right? Jacob's doing that on the back end, but what mm-hmm. you do see him doing are these fucking ball busting, like Metcon workouts. And he writes them up on his board, right? On his on his whiteboard and he walks you through and he's talking about it like right after he's finished it. Yeah. Right. And he's a mess. Yeah. Right. Doing it. And that's my question. Are you working as hard as Jacob is when you're doing your hit training? Um, and because if you're not, if you don't look and sound like that when you're done, probably not working hard enough. Mm-hmm. That's number one. Number two, are you doing that? If you are, are you doing that all the time? Is that your 70% or your 30%? Because I got to, uh, that. This guy's a pro. He doesn't do that. 70% of the time. He knows what to put on Instagram. Yeah. But in terms of his competition, like he's not telling his his competitors what he's doing. He's not putting it up there on the Instagram. I'm telling you, he's not spending 70% of his time doing those Metcon workouts all the time. So yeah. I know it feels good. I know it looks good. It's sexy. You think you need to be doing that. If you're not suffering, you're not working hard enough, that kind of stuff. But if you kind of listen back to kind of what we, what we said, you think about the basic tenets you don't have to be a human, you know, a human physiologist or a physivex kind of expert here. 
Um, I know it's boring. I know there's a lot of science in it. Cardio as a whole is extremely important for all the components that we just talked about. Aesthetics, performance, and longevity. Um, everybody should be doing it, some level of it. You can, if you're just a beginning exerciser, get to the gym, lift some weights, you're going to get some cardiorespiratory benefit from that, right? But over time, you might look at this and how to, how to incorporate it. I would work on getting three to four days of resistance training in before then I started, I started thinking about adding cardio or Metcons in, right? And once you're consistent with that, then maybe I add a Metcon one, or maybe I add some longer, slower distance stuff, add some walks, add some light bike rides. Those are ways to think about this. You don't have to do it all at the same time. But what is important to understand is like this that's been villainized by like cardio sucks, doesn't do anything for you. I just use it as a tool to lose fat, to step on stage. Um, it's going to kill your gains, all that stuff. Ridiculous. A mm -hmm. couple things we didn't mention. It lays down more of a vascular system, right? Better pumps. Better pumps, man. <laughs> better nutrients, better transport to your, to those working muscles that you're trying to build. Like all of the... There's so many things we didn't even talk about, right? That, that you could talk about that are benefits here, um, no matter what your goals are. Um, so anyhow, well, I, we don't actually have like any tools to give people. And you know why? Because I've built these tools before and nobody fucking uses them, right? Um, so we're talking about it. Um, and hopefully you made it through this whole podcast. There is another podcast, you know, I would suggest that you go back and listen to. It's, it's the, number it's, 115. It, there's 57. And number 115. 115, we get deep into the heart rate zone training and all the things. So if you like to nerd out and you want to hear the, the test that we, um, excuse me, the test that we recommend, there's kind of a bike test that you can do and a treadmill or run test that you can do. Um, sorry, 119. Yeah, so it's, it's 119 and episode 57. 57 is kind of the basics that we covered. Uh, you covered on the show, probably hear a lot of repeat information, but on 119, we get deep into those heart rate zones how to test for them, how to calculate them, um, what to do with them when you get there, um, and, and uh, basically some best practices there. So go go check those out. And as always, if you have questions and there's something we may be able to to help you with along your journey, you can hit us. You know, you can hit us by uh, going to the website, or you can call us here at the gym, and somebody will be here to pick up the phone to chat with you about it.